Welcome back to Nomad Nomad, Echoes of Adventure, where we'll be taking deep dives into some of the most interesting motorcycle journeys from this century and the last. And along the way, maybe rediscovering some that have been forgotten over time. So I'm still your hapless host, Jeff Thomas, and in the first Nomad Nomad video, rather cunningly titled Introduction, I said that in episode one, I'd choose one journey and dive into it. Well, that was plan A. And making travel videos in these times of restriction is akin to showing the Great British Bake Off to folks attending Weight Watchers. So although doing this now isn't the best decision I've ever made, hopefully it also won't be the worst. I'm currently in Asia, a continent away from my books and movies which are in England and California. But even if we were together, choosing a first journey to delve into would have been unfair on the traveller under the microscope. I'm new and not very good at this, and could have butchered their life's work, but putting my own incompetence aside, not everybody is aware of just how rich the history of long-distance two-wheel travel is, and as the subtitle of Nomad Nomad is Echoes of Adventure, seeing each journey in the context of those that came before and after it is important. So abandoning Plan A, Plan B is to dedicate this first episode not to one single journey, but to a brief history of motorcycle adventure in general, or more accurately, the history as we currently understand it. I should probably start at the beginning and work backwards in time from there, but there's a reason that Top of the Pops never started with the number one song of the week. But for the sake of brevity and to avoid repetition and boredom, I'll try to concentrate on journeys that for different reasons I feel change the landscape. So if your journey or those of your heroes and heroines don't get a mention today, then don't take it personally, but hit that dislike button anyway. So it's 2019 and the epic duo are at it again, this time with Long Way Up. In an attempt to end the war in Europe before Christmas, they've enlisted help from the United States in the form of Harley Davidsons, and they've swapped petrol for electricity. And then they set out to ride across 13,000 miles of Central and South America. But is it actually an adventure? Well, it's a long way, and it was certainly an adventure for them and for those who were following at home. But had it not been for the use of electric bikes, I can't help feeling that it might have been just one way too far. That's an observation rather than the criticism. But their groundbreaking long way round was always going to be a difficult act to follow. But if I quickly mention that the 2004 Long Way Round was followed by the 2007 Long Way Down, then the first set of adventures has been covered and we can move backwards in time to 2016. Now this week's new entry is Kane Avellano. And after riding a motorcycle for just over one year, which is actually slightly more experienced than Ted Simon and Sam Manicom had before they set out on their first journeys. In April of 2016, a 23-year-old Kane Avellano set out from his home in South Shields to ride around the world on a Triumph Bonneville. Over the course of eight months, Kane covered 28,000 miles, crossed 36 countries on six continents, and arrived back in England with a Guinness World Record, the youngest solo rider to circumnavigate the world on a motorbike. To many, Kane's decision to ride a road-going Triumph Twin had seemed at best unwise, but it certainly brought a smile to my face. You see, a few years earlier, the owner of my local Triumph dealership had described my Triumph Tiger as a street bike wearing an adventure frock, and warned me that if I'd really wanted to ride around the world, I should probably buy myself a BMW. So, I was very pleased to report that Kane of Alano and his Triumph Bonneville both arrived safely home and unscathed. I'm sure there'll be more adventures in the future for Kane, but in 2011, Lois Price was proving herself to be a serial offender, but in a very good way. Already praised for Lois on the Loose, her 2005 ride from Alaska down to Ushuaia, and for Red Tape and White Knuckles, a 2006 journey from London to Cape Town. In 2011, Lois set out to ride solo across Iran, and afterwards added revolutionary ride to a growing list of successful publications. Lois's journey to the Islamic Republic of Iran was made during Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's presidency, and everyone who'd never been to Iran had warned her not to go there. But in Revolutionary Ride, a motorcycle was simply a key to a door, a door that the BBC, CNN and Fox et al. never dared to open. Lois portrayed Iran, and more specifically its people, in a light that hopefully opened and changed people's minds and the attention, praise and prizes that the book went on to receive were certainly well deserved. Now like in Revolutionary Ride, and I guess Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, although the next journey is made on a motorcycle, the motorcycle is really little more than a tool. 
In 2008, Bernard Smith and Cathy Birchall had mounted their old BMW R1100RT and set out to cover 26,000 miles across 30 countries and 5 continents. In itself an achievement, but Cathy would become the first blind woman to circumnavigate the globe. Their journey was recorded in the book, Touching the World, A Blind Woman, Two Wheels and 25,000 Miles. The book is very moving and places you in the shoes of a person who for 30 years of her adult life hadn't seen anything of the world beyond shadows. In 2012, on the day that their book was published, Bernard and Cathy got married. But sadly, in January the following year, Cathy lost her fight with cancer. And in January of 2013, the world lost an inspirational role model and leader. Touching the world has a gentleness running through it, but for those of us following Dan Walsh's 2005 ride through Africa and the Americas, gentle was an adjective that none of us would use. Dan serialised his journey in Bike Magazine, and his gonzo-esque riding reflected a boozy, battling barnstorm of a journey that seemed to cross as many boundaries as it did borders. Some thought that Dan Walsh's style had been adopted for effect, but it hadn't. It was just him being himself. Although his book was originally published as These Are The Days That Must Happen To You, it was later republished as Endless Horizons. And while some still say that his style is like Hunter S. Thompson, while that is certainly a compliment, I think only Dan Walsh could accurately describe another Dan Walsh. Now, we're in 2001, and moving from Kathy Birchall to Dan Walsh, and then here to Ted Simon in the space of a decade, is evidence that the characters making these journeys are as diverse as the routes and destinations they choose. It's hard to imagine two people more different than Dan Walsh and Ted Simon, but having enjoyed alcohol with both of them, beyond their accents and acceptance of written profanity, they're actually not as different as many people would think. I hope they both take that observation as a compliment, which it certainly is. But when in 2001, Ted Simon set out to rediscover the world he'd passed through 30 years earlier with Jupiter's travels, in Dreaming of Jupiter, he also discovers or rediscovers himself. Ted Simon is looking at a changed world, and at 70 years of age, he's looking at it through equally changed eyes. And in many ways, age seems to have added richness to the experience not only for him, but also for those of us who were following along. Quite rightly, Ted Simon is the most celebrated of two-wheeled travellers. But as the drummer and lyricist with Rush, Nick Peart is one of the most famous people to ever ride a bike. But throughout his 1998 journey around North America, his intention has always been to fly beneath the radar. After losing his daughter Selena to a car accident in 1997, and his partner Jacqueline a year later to cancer, when Neil Peart hit the road on his BMW R1100GS, the lyrics, Travel is a Soothing Balm, had been running through his mind. His journey would take him through 55,000 miles of North American geography, at an equal distance through his own emotions. And following his own passing in 2020, Neil Peart's book, Ghost Rider, Travels on the Healing Road, is finally garnering the recognition and praise it so richly deserves. Well, when it comes to Austin Vince, I really don't know where to start. The man is legend, a national treasure, and if anybody thinks that his public persona is an act, they're simply wrong. Austin Vince, in life, is the Austin Vince of Mondo Enduro, where in 1995 his team of intrepid adventurers were defeated by the Zilov Gap in Siberia and later in Terra Circa when they returned to successfully conquer it. And if I wanted to know how many rivets were used in the construction of the Tyne Bridge or which train stopped at Tucumcari, Austin Vince would be the first person I'd ask. If he hadn't chosen to become a math teacher, he could have easily been the next Isambard Kingdom Brunel a successful stand-up comedian, or England's own Sergio Leone. So for those of us who've been inspired and entertained by the Mondos, we should thank ourselves lucky that he also has a fondness for buggering about on motorbikes. So far, we've only ridden back to 1995. I haven't even mentioned Sam Manicom's eight years of around-the-world adventuring, the speed demons Nick Sanders and Kevin and Julia Sanders, or serial around-the-world riders like Greg Frazier or Jeff Hill. Nor Simon and Lisa Thomas, Elspeth Beard, Ed March, Nathan Millward, Jackie Furno, Shaq Locuson, Graeme Field, Dom Giles, Daniela Murdoch, Jeremy Croker, Dylan Wickrama, Dave Barr, or even Simon Gandolfi, the son of a count and the poshest man to ever buy me a beer. A man who since turning 80 has turned to motorbikes and clocked up more than 100,000 miles riding through Europe, Asia and the Americas. 
So for those who've been left out of this brief summary, you're in good company. But one character and journey that can't be left out is Emilio Scotto, who in 1985 set out from his home in Argentina and spent the next 10 years of his life traveling half a million miles around the world. To many, his choice of using a massive Honda Goldwing that he affectionately calls Black Princess seemed inappropriate. But his record of the journey, the longest ride, is very aptly named. Emilio Scotto started his journey 10 years after Ted Simon, but whereas Jupiter was passing through the lives of people he'd met along the way, with more time in his hands, Emilio Scotto had made his bike his home and lingered longer in the lives of the folks that he'd met on the road. The name Emilio Scotto would become mentioned alongside that of Ted Simon, and the picture of him standing arms aloft in front of the Taj Mahal would become as iconic as that of Jupiter sitting aside his triumph in the desert. But while Scotto was wafting around the world on Black Princess, Helga Pedersen had been conquering what is still the nemesis of around the world riders today, Colombia's infamous Darien Gap. Riding his BMW R80 GS, instead of going around the Darien Gap on a ferry like most sane people, or even building his own raft and sailing around it as Dylan Wickrama would do decades later, Helga Pedersen had taken ropes and pulleys and literally dragged himself and his bike across it. No wonder Vikings and Norsemen struck fear into half of the world. Helga Pedersen was relentless, and although his 1998 book, Ten Years on Two Wheels, 77 Countries, 250,000 Miles, is a clue as to just how far and long he travelled, he'll always be known as the first rider to ever conquer the Darien Gap. Ten years before Helga Pedersen was auditioning to become the next Indiana Jones, Aboard a 125cc Kawasaki, French author and journalist Anne France Dorthville had set out on her own adventure. Leaving a home in Paris, Dorthville would ride thousands of miles across Europe, Asia, and North America and become the first known solo female to ever circumnavigate the world on a motorcycle. At the time, she sent articles and photographs back home to magazines and later published the book, Un Demoiselle Sur en Moto, which roughly translates to Girl on a Motorcycle. Now, during her journey, she became famous for pictures of herself posing in wonderful 70s dresses alongside her rough and tumbled Kawasaki. And 40 years later, inspired by her adventure, Paris fashion house Chloe had designed their 2016 collection around her. Well, due to lack of hours rather than adventures, we're jumping back another 40 years to Robert Fulton Jr., who, after making a throwaway comment at a dinner party, would become one of history's most famous two-wheeled adventurers. Having recently graduated from Harvard, in response to a question about what he was going to do with his life, without thinking, he declared his intention was to ride around the world studying architecture. Sitting next to him had been the owner of the Douglas Motorcycle Company, and when he'd offered him a motorbike on which to make the journey, there'd been no turning back. At the age of 23, Robert Fulton Jr. had ridden his Douglas twin from London to Tokyo and then onwards back to London. And at the time, it was thought that he'd been the first ever person to circumnavigate the world on a motorcycle. He'd documented his journey in the book, One Man Caravan, and produced a movie from the footage he'd taken along the way. And bonus fact, he went on to design and build the world's first flying car, the Airphibian, which in 1950 was flown by none other than the world's most famous aviator, Charles Lindbergh. Four years before Fulton Jr.'s journey began, Hungarians Zoltán Szolkowski and Guy Alabartha had set what became the benchmark for multi-year motorcycle expeditions. In 1928, they left Hungary on their Harley Davidson with a sidecar, and after crossing 110,000 miles, 68 countries, they'd arrived home eight years later. In 1937, the book recording their journey had been published in Hungarian, but it wasn't until 2008 when it was republished in the English language, Around the World on a Motorcycle, 1928 to 1936, that we really became aware of just how epically groundbreaking their journey across all six inhabited continents had been. A hundred years before Charlie Borman rediscovered fame on two wheels, vaudeville actor Irwin Baker had turned his own hand to long-distance travelling, and in 1912, riding a company-sponsored Indian motorcycle, he'd travelled 14,000 miles around the North American continent. In 1912, that had been an amazing achievement. But if I tell you that two years later, he would become known as Irwin Cannonball Baker, that might be a clue as to where this story's going. 
In 1914, riding another Indian motorcycle, Irwin Baker had ridden coast to coast from Los Angeles to New York and taken just 11 days to do it, and in doing so had set a record that he and others would constantly try to beat. In 1933, swapping two wheels for four, Irwin Cannonball Baker had set a new time of just 53 and a half hours for the same coast-to-coast -coast journey, a record that would stand for the next 40 years, and all future attempts to beat it would become known as Cannonball Runs. Back in 1973, when Ted Simon set out to ride around the world on his Triumph, he'd assumed that he'd been the first to do it, and back in 1932, so too had a 23-year-old Robert Fulton Jr. However, when in 1912, 20 years before Fulton and 60 years before Jupiter, a 23-year-old American by the name of Carl Stearns Clancy had ridden out of Dublin on a four-cylinder Henderson, the records would go on to show that he'd been the first ever person to successfully circumnavigate the world on a motorcycle. It's hard to imagine the difficulties Carl Stearns Clancy would have faced on that journey, but by successfully riding 18,000 unsupported miles across Europe, Africa, Asia and North America, in a time before many of the countries he'd crossed had paved roads or petrol, it certainly puts our modern journeys into perspective. Reports of Clancy's journey were published in the magazine Bicycling World and Motorcycle Review, and afterwards he'd written the book Gasoline Tramp, but sadly, until American adventurer Greg Frazier had become aware of that journey, those records had been lost to time. In 2010, using Clancy's own photographs and various written articles, Frazier had published his own book about the journey, Motorcycle Adventurer, Carl Stearns Clancy, First Motorcyclist to Ride Around the World, 1912 to 1913. And in 2012, on the 100th anniversary of Clancy leaving Dublin, with a team of different riders from various parts of the world, British author and journalist Jeff Hill had retraced Clancy's journeys and afterwards published his own book, In Clancy's Boots. Following the achievements of Carl Stearns Clancy is difficult, which is one reason why I've worked backwards in time rather than forwards. Looking back, we might assume that the hardest part of Clancy's journey would have been crossing Africa or Asia, but in fact, he declared that the biggest challenge had been crossing his homeland, the United States of America, the part of the journey that took him from San Francisco in the west to New York in the east. Of course, we all think that America would be the easy part, but that's because we see the United States as it is today and assume that it's always been that way. But 1912 was a long time ago and the bits of America in between the oceans wasn't very accommodating for travellers. Well, at least not for travellers riding anything more powerful than a horse. So when we discovered that 10 years earlier in 1903, George Wyman had swung his leg across a California Motor Company motorized bicycle and ridden from San Francisco to New York it puts even Carl Stern Clancy's journey into slightly different perspective. And another bonus fact, before making that first coast-to-coast -coast journey on a motorcycle, George Wyman had become the first person to cycle around Australia. I guess because it was there. In the course of this summary, I've bypassed more journeys than I've covered, some for reasons of brevity, and others through my own ignorance. But hopefully, those that I have covered will give an indication of the richness and diversity of long-distance travel on motorcycles. Whatever you choose to do, the chances are that somebody will have done it before. So next time we polish our framed iron butt certificates, marvel at Ed Bullion's cannonball record, complain about fuel tank and battery range, or whine about the condition of roads crossing Russia, we should all just probably take a minute and think about the folks who blazed those trails before us. Anyway, I hope this first episode has been interesting for some of you, and in the next I will be concentrating on one particular journey, though which journey that'll be I really haven't decided yet. So please like, share and subscribe, tickle the bell to see when the next episode lands, and leave a comment below if you think my choices have been fair or wrong, or if there's anything you'd particularly like to look into. So ride safe, leave more smiles and miles behind you, and I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye now.